I've just been asked to read, and uh, I hope I can get through this. So bear with me. First reading is from Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Word of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Uh, Psalm 21, responsively, uh, 31. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I am the scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. Like the dead, I am forgotten, out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd. Fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. The second reading is from the second chapter of Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, we have come to Palm Sunday. We've come with Jesus to the city of Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. We know what's going to happen. None of the events that take place in the city are surprising. Now, if you're like me, you've heard this story over and over. Each year, Holy Week is pretty much the same. We go through the memories and the scripture readings that carry us from Palm Sunday through Maundy Thursday and Good Friday And sometimes Easter Vigil happens on Saturday. 
not so common in the Lutheran Church, but becoming more common. And then we come to Easter Sunday, where we meet the empty tomb and our risen Lord. We relive in the coming days this rich story of Christ's time in Jerusalem, his betrayal, his trial, his sentence, and his journey outside the city to a hill just on the edge of town and his cross. If you're hearing this story for the first time, if you've never heard this story before, I rather envy you. Sometimes I think we hear it so often, each year, that we take parts of this story for granted. We don't always listen every step of the way because we're quick to anticipate the next chapter and the next verses and the next events. If you're hearing this story for the first time, I rather envy you because these days, And these accounts that we have in scripture of how they unfolded are filled with drama, with power, with emotion. There's danger, there's politics, there's love, and there's injustice. There's money, and there's death. We hear of betrayal, of denial, of corruption, and violence. We hear of faithful people, of faithful women, especially who stay with the Lord right by his side to the very end. We hear of those who care for Jesus' body, who remove it, who anoint it, who cover it, who give a tomb to the Lord. And we hear how each of these moments, each one of them is redeemed. Some of the most horrific scenes that we read of, some of humanity's darkest events, are all redeemed by the Lord because our Lord is really, really good at redemption. We hear these stories again and again. We know what's going to happen, and it's entirely believable to us. Jesus said it would happen. John the Baptist said it would happen. The prophets centuries before said it would happen. We know that it will happen. We know what will happen. We hear it again. We pretend to live it again, step by step. And it lives once more in our hearing together. We follow Jesus to Jerusalem, to trial, to mocking, to death. We join with him as we are joined with him in our baptism to live with him and to die with him and to rise with him again to new life. I invite you to stand as you're able for our gospel. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding with steadfast love, and abounding with steadfast love. I invite you to be seated for the gospel. 
It's a rather long gospel. It's sacred, and it describes things that we know are going to happen. This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. When they began to ask one another which one of them that it would be who would do this, they wondered. A dispute arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you even know me. Jesus said to them, when I sent you out without a purse or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, no, not a thing. He said to them, But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. And indeed what is written about me is being fulfilled. They said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he replied, It is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. And then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who were around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of his high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you, day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him 